Okay, we're good to go. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's business board meeting. Um, I would like to welcome you all to the meeting uh, and also to welcome members of the press and public who are able to join this via a virtual session. Um, if members experience any technical difficulties during the meeting, please refresh your connection in the first instance. If it becomes apparent that we have lost members and are no longer quorum during the meeting, it may be necessary to adjourn. But we won't tempt fate and hopefully that will all be nice and straightforward for everybody today. Um, initially, I'll start with apologies and declarations of interest. I believe currently we just have one registered apology for Tina. Um, so I'm going to begin by calling names of all members of the business board in alphabetical order to establish their presence for the record. So starting with Vic Annals. Yeah, present. Thank you, Vic. Belinda Clark. I'm here. Hi, Belinda. Mike Hurd. I'm good here. Mayor Dr. Nick Johnson. You're on mute, but I can see that you are here. Yeah, no, I'm here. I'm here. Bless you. Thank you. Uh, Andy Neely. Yep, yeah, here. Yeah. Hi, Andy. Nitin Patel. Here. Yeah. Hi, Nitin. Councillor Anna Smith. No, nope. Rebecca Stevens. Rebecca, I can see you here. Good now, everyone. Um, Andy Williams. Here. Yeah. And myself, Al Kingsley, and I'm here too. Um, could the Democratic Services Officer please report any apologies for absence that have been received beyond the one that I've mentioned? Um, Chair, we've only had the one apology from Tina. That's it. Thank you. I, thank you. I, I, I'm just uh, sorry, Anna is away. My deputy is away. So her apologies have also been sent. I'll get them recorded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is an opportunity to declare any pecuniary interests or any other conflicts of interest. Do members have any conflicts they'd like to declare for today's meeting? No. Excellent. This is all going very swimmingly. So let's move on to the minutes um, of our meeting, which was on the 15th of May. I'm sure we can all remember that like it was yesterday. Um, we're asked to approve the minutes of the meeting. Um, Actually, the last one was held on the 13th of July. I apologise. Can I ask whether any members disagree with the accuracy of the minutes that were circulated? No? OK, so I see no objections. So we will take that as carried. Uh, do officers have any further updates to report on the action log? Um. Chair, if I just mention yes. that um, there's a couple of actions on there for September. They'll obviously be they're, they're still underway. Um, one which has not been reflected on the action log, and that's the recruitment of the new members. So we've got the recruitment of the chair itself. That's been done and completed. We should be in a position to complete the, the recruitment of the remaining vacancies on the board by November uh, meeting. Excellent. Thank you, Don. OK, well, in that case, we will move on to item 2.1 on the agenda, which is the state of the economy, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough report. Um, that is going to be presented to us initially by Patrick White from Metro Dynamics, um, and will share that with us um, on behalf of the combined authority. Patrick, good afternoon to you, sir. I see you there. Afternoon, Chair. Um, afternoon, Board. Um, so I think this um, update is on a page 13 of your pack. Um, I can't screen share from from where I am as a, a, as, a as a guest on this. So I'm just going to talk um, through it, if if that's OK, and um, assume uh, and hope that uh, everyone who is interested in watching has the has has access to the papers. Um, so I hope that's OK. Um, what this report does is to present a, a, a kind of fairly headline update on the available uh, kind of economic and, and social kind of uh, metrics. We, we've done a number uh, of similar reports over the course of the last couple of years, and the aim's really been to try and keep a, keep a track of um, 
a set of kind of headline uh, economic metrics as the economy has kind of emerged from uh, COVID um, and and kind of more recent uh, kind of shocks. So so this is very much about trying to uh, help the board understand the kind of headline position and to suggest kind of indicators and things which are, uh, are kind of worth watching um, in the period ahead. Um, so that's what this does. Um, the pack's kind of split into two. There's a, there's a fairly uh, hefty set of uh, kind of detailed pieces of data um and then a sort of seven or eight slides up front um that kind of summarize what we think all that all that means as it kind of helps to answer some of the so what questions and i was just going to talk for a couple of minutes about about the upfront uh kind of slides i think the first thing to say is the economic picture is kind of well known to us all so i'm not going to go through that in detail now but there are some elements of the national picture if you like which are particularly relevant i think to cambridgeshire uh, and, and Peterborough. Um, and the first of those is a kind of un, uncertainty and some some slowdown in manufacturing um, and some kind of concerns around the sort of purchasing managers uh, kind of index and things. Um, and that data doesn't kind of show up. The most recent kind of manufacturing national data doesn't show up in kind of local data yet. But keeping keeping an eye on our on our manufacturing sector feels like a really obvious thing to say, but it is definitely important during this kind of uh, th th this period. And th this this kind of odd uh, odd combination of factors that leads to effectively a sort of stagflationary kind of national picture uh, is one that we need to kind of keep keep looking into and to try and kind of understand what's going on inside the kind of individual priority sectors in CPCA. And I think that's that's worth kind of um, noting because actually our qualitative awareness, you know, and the qualitative intelligence and understanding we have is as good as the quantitative because there are time lags in the quantitative data. So actually as a, as a, as a business board, it's our, as much as anything, it's our kind of experience of the day-to-day -day kind of position in our major sectors which helps us uh as much as as much as any of the data at the moment and you can see um if you look at the the latest kind of ons figures for sort of national economic output that came out last week just how kind of much variation there is at the moment between kind of uh national figures you know, uh, and how much they are being updated and how much our sort of statistical understanding of what's going on is subject to quite a lot of change. And that was, was the case all the way through uh, kind of COVID, but it's definitely continued to be the case as the kind of data, the official data, if you like, kind of catches up with where, where local economies are. Um, so just to draw a few points um, really from this work about about the local economy then having set the kind of national context um i think the first thing to say is that um which isn't in our report because we wrote it before last week um if you look at that if if you if we had done this work this morning uh, off with the benefit of ons's latest revised data um i think you draw a slightly different conclusion about the overall uh, economy if you if you applied the latest ONS figures from last week to CPCA as a whole, and if CPCA performed as well as or better than the national economy, which is good reason to assume it would do, then you will have effectively recovered to your kind of pre-COVID uh, level. So, so it is it is probably the case that when ONS comes to revise their figures again, they will have concluded that by now. Uh, CPCA is kind of effectively uh, back to or slightly above um, its pre-COVID levels. So that's worth knowing. Um, that's that's not what it says um, on in our report, but that's because the data changed last week. So that's worth kind of knowing. Um, I think it's also um, worth knowing that my, my working assumption is that the economy is probably doing a little bit better um, than that. And I'd be interested in, in conversation for people's kinds of views about the kind of qualitative assessment of um, of CPC of the CPCA economy um, at, at the moment. So I think I think it's worth saying that we we kind of think that the economy is back to its pre-COVID levels and that there are some other elements of of the kind of national picture which are, which are having a bit of an impact uh, at the moment which are worth watching and i'll just kind of tick through a few of those a few of those now um it's worth saying that foreign direct investment has performed 
relatively strongly. We've seen a fairly strong increase in the number of jobs created from FDI, and that's a big deal for the nation, you know, as a whole. So, so the way in which Cambridgeshire and Peterborough and and Greater Cambridgeshire in particular is recovering is important locally, but is also extremely important for the UK as a whole. Um, and at a time when private sector investment is extremely important, then the role that uh, your economy plays in that is worth. Uh, worth noting and forms an important part of any conversation with government about you know future investment and future devolution and so on um at the same time there's some uncertainty in the numbers around kind of jobs growth and some kind of variation uh, in kind of jobs growth in the region and you picked some of that up anyway in the work that you're doing around kind of skill strategy and things but i think there's certainly something to um we need to consider in terms of continuing to make sure that we're focusing on creating and supporting the creation of the right kinds of jobs uh, in the region. That's a core part of your economic strategy. Um, some encouraging numbers, I think, on productivity, potentially. And again, regional local productivity uh, numbers are you know, fraught with difficulty and are fraught with time lags and all the rest of it. But um, we think there's a kind of reasonably strong set of indicators around the productivity gap closing um, and potentially um, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough's kind of if if this story about GVA is 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 true and is strengthening, then that is partly because of a of a of a, of a strengthening kind of regional productivity um, story. Um, definitely some variations in kind of overall performance in your key sectors. Um, and this is why manufacturing is important, because over the last couple of years, your manufacturing sector appears to have responded really quite strongly and more strongly than, uh, you know, other other parts of the sector in other parts of the country. And um, if the current kind of pressures on your manufacturing sector um, sort of slow that down, then that's an issue. Although it may be that um, the the sector locally is just very pretty well placed to to weather some of that. Um, no particular kind of um, huge numbers of kind of business count growth, um, but um, some quite interesting um, increases in sort of total numbers of businesses um, in Finland and Peterborough. So, so some indication, if you like, the sort of economic churn uh, and kind of active entrepreneurialism and things have kind of started to tick up again uh, post post COVID uh, and Brexit and, and and so on. I think I just leave with some. Um, thoughts about some of the kind of um, major things to watch um, over the course of the next kind of couple of years. I know there's some work kind of starting on a, a more kind of in-depth look into the state of the region and the economy. And these are perhaps some of the things which are worth kind of uh, keeping in mind as you get into those kinds of conversations in the period ahead. Um, growth has ticked up um, and how we think about continuing to kind of invest in the things which are barriers to future growth uh, is is going to be is going to be kind of really important and 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 what's going on here so we know that um lack of commercial space um is important in different ways across different parts of the economy but particularly in terms of uh kind of lab space and things down in uh Greater Cambridgeshire and parts of Huntingdonshire. Um, and we've also seen kind of consistently uh, constrained supply um, of um, commercial space uh, in places like Fenland. So, so commercial space and strong demand for co commercial space uh, is worth is worth watching. Um, if overall productivity is kind of growing, then um, we also know that Peterborough uh, and Fenland still have kind of historical kind of productivity gaps, if you like. So targeting our thinking and our interventions around productivity and what's going on in the different parts of our economy is going to be hugely important as well. Um, housing affordability and the relationship between housing affordability and utility constraints is, again, a kind of an obvious point to make, but that will start to, well, that will continue to feed through into kind of headline economic numbers in the period ahead. So if you're thinking about the constraints and things to focus on uh, in terms of further analysis or further work uh, in the months ahead, then this combination of kind of utility constraints uh, and housing uh, and housing constraints uh, is a core element of future growth um, and and then how that plays out in terms of jobs growth. So commercial space, um, some of the big 
utility barriers to kind of future growth and how that's feeding through into kind of jobs growth feel like us to be the things to uh, kind of potentially uh, kind of most keep an eye on uh, and most look into uh, in the period ahead. Um, so I'll stop there, Chair. Very happy to take any questions on any of the detail or discuss any of that, but I um, hope that's a useful canter through some of the headlines. Thank you, Patrick. Um, there's a, there's an awful lot in that report to to unpick. I'm, I'll, I'll look for any hands for any questions that pop up. One question I, I just wanted to to, to just ask you was work. where you saw any variances, Patrick, in terms of this most updated report compared to our previous expectations. Yeah, because one of the one of the considerations is we use this data to consider. Um, our own strategic decisions and so yep. sometimes the variances that were unexpected are more meaningful than those that have plotted a common trend yeah i think the headline um point on that chair is actually growth has probably done better than the statistics might have expected but probably as as well as people thought it was, if you see what I mean. So actually our perceptions, I think, as people, you know, all the people on this call, people who are working in the economy and have seen bits of it doing well over the past kind of, you know, couple of years, have probably expected the overall growth figures to be a bit better than they were. And they they do appear to have been a bit better than the numbers were saying they were. So I think that's worth, that's definitely one uh, kind of variance, um, which is, which is, which is important. Um, I think the, um, the, the, gains in productivity but the unequal nature of those gains spatially is worth highlighting as well and again this is not surprising but um the fact that the productivity gap you know is widest in Finland and has continued to uh widen um and that Peterborough has potentially seen a kind of leveling off or, or a kind of potential decline in some of the productivity figures is the other variation which is worth uh kind of noting um I'll probably leave it there Thank you. I see we've got quite a few hands up. Um, I believe Andy, you were first. Yeah, thanks. So just on that same theme, Patrick, um, do you have any insight into why productivity is, so in Finland, it talks about it worsening over the five, last five year period. So, so what's driving that? Is it, is it a shift in terms of makeup of sectors? Is it more low skilled jobs? Is it um, uh, lower value added, higher input costs. Some some unpacking of that, if you've been able to do that, would be helpful. Um, second thing, um, can you just also comment on the the statement overall? The economy is unlikely to reach the GVA doubling GVA target over twenty five years. Because I mean, yeah. we're, you're aware there's some different different views on how you calculate the GVA and whether we'll hit that target. But just unpacking that, would be helpful. And then the final thing, I'm, I'm not sure this is one you can answer, but it's something of the business board to think about on the utility constraints, both water and energy are flagged up. And the question I've got is, are we doing enough on both of those to actually make sure they, well, water has already become a problem with the Environment Agency objecting to various planning applications. Um, are we doing enough on both of them to make sure they, uh, in the water case, it gets, um, we get over the problem in energy, it never becomes a problem because we made the investments initially uh, in advance of when it does become a problem. On the um, on the headline output and output trajectory versus kind of target, yeah, I think um, I think this kind of does depend on a little bit on which methodology um, you use. I think it's worth us doing uh, just comparing uh, a couple of different methodologies off the back of last week's ONS uh figures i think if i think depending on that uh, that's depending on the detail of methodology i think it, you you we might well come to a conclusion you know uh looking ahead that actually the economy is uh slightly closer to its kind of original uh, to its target trajectory than you know a, a, a certain methodology might kind of suggest so um one of the things that and you know it depends on what year you start and it depends on uh, some of the weights you put inside the methodology. So I think it's worth, um, I, I think I think you're probably, as I said, I think you're probably doing a bit better than some numbers might suggest. And I think the thing to do is to just uh, do a bit of uh, methodological kind of uh, comparison off the back of ONS's latest revisions um, and potentially come back to the board. But I would, if you, if you said to me, is, is is it are we, are we is the balance on the upside or the downside risk? I think the balance is on the upside. Um, I think you're probably closer to trajectory than some numbers might suggest. 
um on on the the variations in in productivity i i think this is something which warrants uh kind of deeper analysis particularly when you come to thinking about kind of um investment priorities over the next kind of few years but my sense is is that this is largely driven by differences in terms of employment growth versus output in different parts of the patch so i think recruitment patterns and staffing patterns have kind of changed in some sectors which has which has contributed to what appears to be declining productivity if you look at the statistics so so essentially you've seen kind of you know increased employment in lower value sectors um in in some parts of the patch and that 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 shows up in the numbers as declining productivity or flatlining productivity where you've got concentrations of those sectors um and i think that's what's behind the numbers um the reasons for that so you know some of that might be directly related to growth in employment in some kind of healthcare sectors some bits of the healthcare sector for example some of that might be uh increase in some kinds of employment in bits of the kind of agricultural sector so i think it needs that there's a kind of sector by sector answer to that but in terms of what's driving the numbers andy i think it's the relationship between output and employment in some clusters um it, it, that's my sort of statistical uh kind of answer um so i hope that responds to your point that's really helpful uh, thank you patrick that there might be a an action point just to take away in terms of some of that um the, the conversation point andy raised in terms of energy water uh, and how that fits into the strategic planning as well um i'm conscious we've had a few people waiting very patiently i believe Nitin, you're next and then yeah. rebecca patrick couple of questions in terms of timing of the data i mean they always review the data so why don't we wait a little bit because i'm not sure you writing a report and telling us then it's not correct maybe is really that productive in my mind second thing who's who's looking for uh lab space what type of companies i think the timing of the data points a good one Nitin. look and, and I, that's why i said at the start actually our qualitative understanding is you know important to overlay isn't it on our quantitative understanding i mean the short answer is ons revised stats the whole time so they'll they'll never they'll never be a perfect point um to look at the data um and and different data points are revised at different points in time yeah. so if you waited for the latest revisions of everything it would never it would never happen if you see what's I mean. no, I know, but in terms of the current growth data yeah. it's quite frightening yep. in, in the sense that told everyone it wasn't anywhere near and then said actually it grew better so Lots of companies and people really took decisions. But anyway, that I agree oh, yeah. in what you're saying. But in terms of the other one, who who is actually looking for a lab space? Because you hear that a lot. And if they're startups, then I'm not seeing a lot in terms of saying they haven't got space. Or is it businesses wanting to come into the area? I think, and there are colleagues on the call that will have their fingers closer to the to some of the sectors than I. I think I think what is driving lab space in particular in uh Greater Cambridge and South Cams is a combination of existing larger businesses looking to grow and then some location decisions. So I don't think I don't think this is primarily SME uh, related. Um, I think it is primarily larger businesses seeking either to grow or others seeking to locate. But again, that there will be people who have a, their fingers, you know, uh, on the pulse of the the actual conversations um, that won't yet show up in the data. That that would be quite interesting, though, wouldn't it? Because if we're going to create industrial space at any point, it'd be nice to push it in that direction, knowing there's potentially reasonable businesses coming in rather than the traditional startups looking for a, a little space. Yeah. Thanks, Nitin. Rebecca, over to you. Uh, thanks, Chair. And handily, Andy, picked up on the three questions that I was going to ask and and just to just to dig a bit deeper perhaps on one of them which was the Fenland one I mean we're used to seeing Fenland's stats perhaps not compare with some of the other areas and and it would be unfair to compare Fenland with 
Cambridge because it's not apples with apples. But and you've addressed to some extent the productivity, but it also doesn't feature very well in quite a few of the other metrics. And I wondered, Patrick, whether you wanted to um, comment on that. And then I suppose from a board perspective, whether we need to kind of do a bit of a deep dive or something and, and as to what we what we do about this. Um, I'm, I'm very conscious that we get these reports and that every time I read them and I go, oh, that's really interesting and there's loads of great information. And then, uh, you know, we kind of go on to the next one and, and I think the same thing and we don't have a sort of an ongoing discussion. I'm sure it will, it will be taken through at officer level, but as a board, maybe we should kind of pick this up at in between times. On the on, on the data point, I mean, I, I think the basic issue for Finland is a combination of lower, what are historically lower value sectors in terms of wages and skills, plus a lower kind of lower value housing market and all the things that come with essentially a series of lower employer numbers lower lower wages so and i think i think the art i think the the one of the things for the for, for the business board going forward is to think about actually what their what your kind of sectoral goals are what you what what is what role is someone like fen is 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 fenden playing um in in the regional economy and you know there's been significant work done in the past on agriculture and kind of productivity in high-tech agriculture given the agricultural assets that you've got the question of kind of water and environmental management um and what that actually means you know there's there are some strategic kind of you know prioritization questions for the longer term aren't there about actually what role this part of the uh but this part of the the region is is playing and i think that that's from a strategy perspective if you like that's actually probably as you suggest the right way into it because simply simply saying oh the numbers look quite low is 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 taken out of context isn't particularly helpful it's just I mean, um it's actually what what role is this part of the country playing but fundamentally what's driving the numbers is 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 low 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 wage low wage levels essentially um and that's a sectoral issue rather than a rather than just a defendant issue patrick thank you for that uh, rebecca just on on the point that you raised there because i think it's, it's an important one for us to take forward for future business board meetings is collectively with the business board to to be mindful of not just the uh, the sector economic data but the overlay on how that aligns with transport skills and others so that when we are looking at future strategic planning there's a bit more of a closing of the loop of, of all that information together so that it has a bit more of a what if than a just of interest um so i i, I very much take your point and i think with the with the new structures and representation across the different uh, committees that will also provide an opportunity to bring back a bit more of a cohesive picture as well. Um, Andy, and then Vic, if that's okay. Uh, thanks, I'll, I'll start by answering your question. I'm not supposed to do that, but I think I will do. Uh, so there's about a million square feet of uh, space required in the Cambridge and South Cambridge market at the moment, primarily around life sciences. And it's relatively across the whole piece. So within the UK, there's still quite a lot of startup activities, so the lack of incubator space and the lack of grow on space. And then from outside of the region, there are companies looking to establish their first location in Cambridge, one to build their credibility and to build their skill sets. And then a second set of people looking to come in to establish their first European or UK. So the former sub smaller companies and the bigger companies looking to establish a UK presence. So there's about 30 to 40 companies at the moment who can't move into Cambridge because there isn't space for them. So the issue is quite critical and it's actually affecting growth in life sciences. Um, I've got more questions. Well, there are more observations. Very interesting, actually, Patrick, um, a very useful document. I see in our section 2.2 on page 11, it says, oh no, 2.1. Well, uh, it does not need to be read in full, but may act as a useful document for over time. I'd say we should be reading it in full because it basically summarizes everything that's going on in our economy. And if the business board aren't reading it in full, they don't know who should be, frankly. Um, and then in that context on um, 
the uh, page 17 of our report, although we've heard some provisos now, the economy is unlikely to reach the target doubling GVA over 25 years. I mean, that is the purpose of the Cambridge and Peterborough combined authority. So I think we have to take that phrase very seriously, even if uh, we think there are some challenges to that. And I'd recognize Dr. Nick will tell us that needs to be good growth and needs to be in a certain sustainable way. I'd agree with all that, but I think that doubling of GVA over 25 years is something that we should concentrate our minds. And then we're provided with six areas which we'll be focusing on. Perhaps as we move the business forward to more strategic focus, we could balance our agendas based on those barriers and risks to growth uh, rather than uh, reviewing how certain projects have been going for several years in and the cost and cash profile of those. Um, so having read the report, having told everyone else to read it, so I better prove I have read it, I would just, I mean, there's lots of things you could look into. I, I was interested in the current context of some of the other things I'm doing at the moment on page 54 on the transport uh, and how in uh, England in general, it takes about the same time to get your place of work or your place to get things roughly equal by walking, cycling, or by car. Um, in uh, Cambridgeshire, it's much easier to get anywhere by car. And even then it's not that easy. And I assume that's linked to probably to a housing affordability and travel to work areas. I imagine Dr. Nick, as the bus service continues to deteriorate, we'll have a, con a continuing challenge with travel to work area and that continuing disconnect between it's easy to get in your car and faster than it is to go by bus and so the more we can do to make a reliable fast bus network system uh, the better we will all be both in terms of uh, employees ability to get to work but also in terms of sustainability uh, and then finally perhaps on the question Patrick in terms of this we've got our economic refresh coming along as well is um, we, I, I, we get a, a, a quarterly or six month report from CBR, uh, Cambridge Business Research, um, which has slightly different data to the ONS. And obviously the ONS data is the gold standard, but perhaps if we can get those two side by side sometime in the future, we can get a, the CBR kind of gives a different cut to the economic growth data, particularly in the Greater Cambridge area. It'd be nice to see those two side by side, at least when we're doing our um, state of the nation work moving forward. I'm not sure I had a question there, but I finished. Thank you, Andy. Patrick, did you want to come back on those points? Obviously, one, perhaps just to preempt, is there clearly needs to be some more discussion around that GVA measure and, and giving us a position of where we are against that that headline doubling. Uh, and, and I totally support your comments that you made, Andy, in terms of linking up to some of those key strands in terms of business board schemes. You'll notice next week we're going to talk about transport and some other bits to hopefully start to move a little bit more of an alignment on those. Patrick, did you want to just comment in terms of some of the other bits that um, Andy raised? No, I mean, just to say that the, the point about kind of using a uh, an in-depth kind of, you know, state of the region kind of conversation to actually do a bit of a bottoms up on all the data is is, is absolutely the right thing um, to do. Um, and there are, you know, many different methodologies for regional GBA and so on. And actually setting them all alongside each other and kicking it around a little bit might seem like a niche geek activity, but it's absolutely uh, something that you should do as part of that wider work. Um, and uh, yeah, the only reason for saying you might not want to read it is I always feel a bit guilty about sending people 55 slides worth of data. Um, but uh, absolutely. You, know, you just don't see what we get then, Patrick. If you think 55 slides is a lot, you've no idea. <laughs> Very good. Yes, well, that, thank you for that. For our cohort of niche geeks, we've uh, got Vic next, I believe, and then Mayor Nick. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to do my usual thing. First thing I'm going to say, the way that we're given information as business board members is in, inadequate from my point of view. To be given this report and then to be talked through it without having slides or summaries or, or some sort of highlight doesn't help us because we're all now following our own, going down our own rabbit holes. And I'll give you some examples. And, and people have raised quite a lot of good things at the moment. Um, the Peterborough and Fenland productivity, I don't accept that Fenland's productivity having dropped by 25% is simply because of low wages. It's dropped because of some other reason, because it's always had low wages. And I'd love to know more. But the good thing is, from the skills Employment and Skills Committee this morning, there was a deep dive into the Fenland economy. Of course, it's not reflected here, nor is it shared with the business board, but it's another piece of the picture that we as business board members need to be given so that we can understand what's going on. And I'm sure that some of the deep dive would 
support what we're being presented here and some of it might conflict but the pieces together um, make it much better also in peterborough and fenland you've seen the only two areas that have exceeded the growth in in new startups um, and it'd be great to know why that's the case fdi projects and that al don't worry it's not gonna be a long rant i've got key points that i want to get across fdi projects 29 projects yay i'm sure growthworks told us they'd hit a lot more fdi figures than 29 in the um, reviews that we've been given. And I'd love to know how it matches up to what we think is the FDI in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, because I'm absolutely certain, because I've got the slides from the last Growth Works review, that they were claiming an awful lot more than 29 um, projects. Um, economic e inactivities talked about, and, and again, Fenland is highlighted, but 60% of the economically inactive people, according to this report in Fenland, are over 65. Leave them alone. Let them have a life. They want to enjoy their life. And we keep talking about targeting over 50s as well. You know what? Some of them don't actually want to actually come back to the workforce because I think we should be creating happiness. And it doesn't sound to me like we're trying to create happiness. It isn't like we're not striving for that. If we're talking about what role does Fenland play in the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough economy? Well, it doesn't necessarily need to play a role. It's an area of the population that we should be looking after. And I worry that it doesn't get the care and attention it needs. And if we start to say it's not got a role to play because it's a weak part of our economy, let's focus on the strong parts of our economy. The gap is getting ever wider. So we've got 25 percent less activity in Finland or less productivity in Finland. And we're already worried about the gap between Greater Cambridge and Finland. Well, this is making it even worse. Um, I've got a couple of other points that I'm, I'm going to answer on, and Andy um, nailed this as well. I've spoken to at least two investors recently who are bringing laboratory space into Cambridge. We've got the Grafton and the Beehive, and they're absolutely sure they will fill that space overnight. They won't have any problems at all in filling the additional lab space they're bringing into the centre of Cambridge. So that just so we got some reassurance to the questions Nitin um, was raising before. Um, so ultimately, I'd like to see this information in a way drawn against our strategic intent, highlighting what is important to us so that we don't all miss each, each of us pick on different nuggets of information. Um, and this report is too much. It's, it's, it's not signposted clearly enough, which we would then be able to digest. And I get that, Andy W., you're able to digest this sort of information. And I applaud you for that. But the rest of us are mere mortals. So we need a bit more guidance and help when we're given this type of valuable information, if I may say. There's quite a lot there, Vic, and thank you for um, for, for sharing that. Um, one thing, without wanting to um, sound too much like a promise of tomorrow, um, I am very conscious of is that collectively as a business board, we need to clarify both the information that we want, but also potentially reformat slightly our business board meetings to provide a connector that members who are on other committees can share highlights, which would start to provide that bridge in terms of you having the context of the, the information you discussed this morning and be able to share that as an overlay. Um, however, I do absolutely agree. I think collectively, much as it's a harder task than it may sound, the ability to overlay some of these different bits of information and see the context around them would be really useful. But probably the onus is on us to shape that a little bit more in the coming weeks. I'll pause there and over to you, Mayor, if that's OK. Thank you, Al. And I, I suspect I'm going to pick up a little bit uh, on from what Vic said. And we are probably all conscious that we go down our little rabbit holes. And I'm sort of but within those rabbit holes. I think there are some important information. And I just wanted to get people, if they haven't seen it, to draw attention to some of the more, uh, what I would argue, are the real concerns to me. I mean, I know maybe you're not going to hit double GBA, but it would worry me greatly when I look at the health um, health statistics at the end around child poverty, life expectancy and fuel poverty. Uh, now, a question is, it's mostly to Metro Dynamics, because I'm trying to remember, and I've seen these reports before. I don't know if these are new additions, but they are definitely information that I'm aware of. And obviously, there is an expectation partly driven by mayoral priorities as much as by combined authority priorities that these sorts of things should be drawn to attention as part of the state of the economy 
And I think my question is, have we included these particular um, statistics in previous reports? Because I'm glad they are there and I'm grateful for them being done on this occasion. My apologies if I don't remember it being done before. But I think many of the questions and uh, possibly some of the answers to why uh, poorer performance, particularly in the areas that we talk about and the levels of inequality, can actually be put down to health. Uh, um, you know, and that's both physical and mental health and well-being of the population. And I guess what I'm trying to draw analogy is, is when we're presented with this information as a business board, first of all, does everybody, uh, you know, kind of see it for the, what I do and how by if we then take the work within the combined authority and the ambition to do more co um, collaboration with the integrated care group, um, integrated care partnership and dealing with issues around public health to help in this one area, which understandably, I'm sure people understand why I'm particularly passionate about it, I'll allow those in the business board who have got interest in manufacturing and know about business startups, but I can't help reiterating the point. I think this is a big area that we hopefully as a business board will agree to work on in conjunction with the mayoral office and the combined authority to look, start challenging health inequality to help solve some of the problems in terms of the business performance. So I only had one question there. Have we done it before? Because if we haven't, I'm grateful it's there. Yeah, so we did we we did we did broaden out the sort of set of indicators we included in this. We haven't um this is this was done for the business board separately. So we haven't sort of um cross-checked this against all the kind of uh CPCA wide indicator set and metrics, but we decided to put some extra things in here basically to keep broadening out um you know the 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 indicator set that you get. And like I say, Al, if you let me just come back on that, I am very grateful because that is the point of an economy. What's the point of a growing economy if we're getting worsening inequalities and a, and a population that's becoming more and unhealthy? Thank you. I think that's point point well made, Nick. And, and again, I think there are um, conversations to be had on on a broader level that while some of the different elements and indicators in this report may seem one or two step removed from business one of the bigger strategic considerations is that we know there's a stepping stone here that skills plus availability of jobs plus effective transport and housing has a direct input on quality of life and indirectly in health as well so uh, there's a much more complex ecosystem and one of the things is to look at how we prioritize and focus and not forget any of those sectors in our conversations Richard, you've been waiting very patiently, so I'll give you a medal as well as let you speak. <laughs> yeah, no, th 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 thanks, Al. I, I, I just think there's, um, it's been a really useful um, conversation and feedback on on the report. I was just thinking there's probably an action for us to take away, which I think is probably something to do with um, resetting, you know, the sort of um, business planning cycle because we don't produce these uh, reports independently of each other. They're all, you know, part of a process. We set a strategy, an economic growth strategy. We set targets within that strategy. Uh, we have an implementation plan. We produce, an in, we produce an annual report, you know, that sets out the performance against the things that we said that we would do and some of the things that perhaps we didn't do or didn't do so well as we should have done. And, and then we get further information telling us, you know, what's going on externally in terms of the economy. And these things need to, you know, feed into a, uh, an ever, you know, and hopefully that would help with this idea that we're, we're, we're losing things in rabbit holes or we're, you know, we're providing information in a way in which it's not very digestible for some people. So I think, you know, re restating what the business planning cycle is for the business board and its economic growth strategy and its implementation and readjusting that strategy and the review process if we could get that really well defined and clear and and uh, bring everybody on side with that 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 might be helpful and we'd certainly be happy to you know take that action away with us richard that's appreciated i think it's really important in the coming weeks as a business board that we can provide a degree of context and steer on that i think quite a few of the points raised today in, in a really healthy conversation is that these re reports have value in isolation, but far greater value when brought together 
and it's actually some of the key data that's put alongside the relevant data from other reports that provides that context for discussion. So the timings, um, which has been referenced, is definitely where possible helpful. But I also think knowing these reports are used for different recipients, it's which which elements together would be most purposeful for the business board. Um, so hopefully we can provide some guidance on that as well to assist with your um, activities, Richard. I don't see any more hands up, so well done, folks. It looks like we are on the home straight. Um, as this is a recommendation, just to note, can we all agree that this report has been noted? I think fairly thoroughly, actually. So thank you for your contributions. Al, can I just question that? Why, why is this just to note? Why isn't it something more fundamental for us to respond to? Because this is pretty you know, important to us. What, what was the decision behind just noting this information? I think in in most cases, and I will I will defer to our uh, governance advisors to give a slightly clearer dis distinction here. This report is identifying state of play as opposed to a proposed action, and as such, it is one simply for us to note the data in the report and comment as we have done, as opposed to make a recommendation to any purpose coming from it at this stage. Uh, and I'm stand to be corrected by any officers who want to uh, clarify on that point. Can I just say that there should be an output from this that we then follow that would be actionable? Do we have to agree a certain set of outputs or that's it? We just note it and move on. Um, again, I think it, for the right reasons, um, I will I will do my best to cover on there. This is a good good way of testing my position on, on understanding of this process. Um, I believe, hopefully, collectively, as a combined authority, that this economic data and others will subsequently shape some of our policy decisions and strategic planning. And at the point where the policy decisions are crafted, that will be the opportunity for the business board and other stakeholders to either recommend or, or, or question any of those elements. So it may be a timing thing, and I, I, I get a sense and I can empathise that we want naturally useful data to be used for a purpose as soon as possible. So there's a challenge there, I, I acknowledge. Good. No officers tried to cut me off, which means I probably haven't said anything I shouldn't have done. So we'll take that as a win. Chair, Chair, I agree with what you said. Thank you. And I, th I think it was to note, Vic, because we wanted your feedback and input into this, because this is going to feed into the wider kind of um, state of the region that's, that's currently underway at combined authority level as well. So we can record it as an action if you want to, if you want to, if you want us to follow up as officers, Vic, uh, and then that could be recorded formally. If not, We've taken note of your comments uh, for members, and that'll be obviously fed back into the combined authority. I, th I think it would, we'll take it as a note for this meeting, but clearly given some of the business to do for the business board in terms of shaping some of the perhaps tweaks to the format for future meetings, then there may be an opportunity to refine that for certain topics, if that's okay, Don. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. Okay, let's move on to item 2.2, budget and performance. Uh, this will be presented by the finance manager, Bruna Mengati. Bruna, good Hello, to see you. Nice I know you're on you. the call. Yes, can you hear me all? We can hear you, thank you. Yes, so no. I'm going to hand over to you to talk through the oh. uh, finance report. Thank you very much. So this is the items 2.2. So this give you a summary of what's going on, uh, what is our position, um, financial position to date. So in relation to revenue and income, especially for income, we haven't received any of the, uh, of the extra contribution that we were expecting for the government yet. The only thing we were expecting to date was the growth up base uh, contribution. This, this is just being uh, delayed by the process for actually the application to getting the growth up funds and mostly from the DBT side, not ours. But anyway, we are expecting to get money from them. There is no risk to it and there is no risk in any of the 3.7 million budget that we have put in these year accounts, as you can see, because there is no changes between that and the forecast. In relation to cost, some of the um, costs are, so the cost is 1.9 million compared to a budget of 2.7. That means we have 800,000 pounds less spent than we were originally expected. Uh, you can see a st starting growth and year 
ERRF, they are both, well, especially the, the first one, he, he, we spend more this year at originally planned this because we were expecting this to be completely finished last year. This is just the tail end of a project. The other big variance that we all know and love is growth co services that uh, as is still performing under budget. We are uh, still committed to um, in, invest and use all the funds available to GrowthCo by the end of the uh, their contract, that is December. And that's why we are still keeping the 4.8 million pounds that was in the budget and remain in the forecast. In relation to capital, the biggest part of our capital, so we spend 1 million out of the 6 million that we had available. So there is a variance of 4.9 million, 5 million if you want. This again, all of it is related to GovCo, the GovCo's additional equity funds. This is also managed by GG as the other part. The overall value that we are expected to invest in the region through GG this year is 7.6 million. We have some uh, concern, but the data that they have been provided to us from GG shows that there is enough to be able to spend that or get very close to this amount. Of course, we are getting a bit worried about the timing of it. We, we, we might have a risk that the information will be passed to us and then us had to manage the, the giving of the funds outside the contract, but that's, um, yeah, that might be problematic. But um, at the same time, we cannot at the moment ascertain what is going to be, if any, variances to this number. Bruno, could you just could you just expand on what what would be problematic were we to underfund on that seven point six? But it, it, it's not the underfunds; is that uh, we have, for what my conversation with Steve in the past, what we understood was that the, the GG is uh, uh, believing that we can meet the seven point six or get very close to it. As the time is drawn closer, so we are now well four months away from the close of the contract. Uh, and although we still believe they might have found everybody that they need our support so we can fulfill the grants, there is a risk that this information will be given to us, but not all the vetting and all the process will have been done to completion so that some of our officers will have to take some of these back to be able to complete these. Okay, thank you. Um, hope, please let me know if it's unclear. In relation to capital, so the last section that you have here is what is our actual expenditure in the future year and what we still have to approve. So the um, things that we are moving forward from previous year, from this year and moving forward, there is only the E. IEG student space that we are expecting to go ahead. And then we have the rural and in England funds, that is the rural part of this UK SPF, which is going ahead, but we haven't really approved it yet because we don't really fully have a plan in place yet. In relation to recycle funds, that is very important considering that we use the majority of this fund and the one for the enterprise zone in the future to create a new team, a couple of um, the new, new economy and, and in Cambridgeshire. You can see that there is a much variances from the last time we have a look at it, but we will expect to get a combined. Um, so recycled capital will be, are we expecting to get by the end of this year, five million pounds? and have a uh, um, recycled revenue of 472,000 pounds. That is very similar to what we already seen when we put together the paper last month, last time we spoke. Likewise, you can see underneath there is the enterprise zone. 
The enterprise note zone income at the moment is set to 915,000 pounds. We just received information from Malcolm Bay that these will be higher than expected on the region of 90,000 pounds more than we were expecting. So that will be definitely helpful. And apart that, yes, it will still be, of course, with the planning place that we have here, it would be um, still expecting to be able to meet the requirement for the new teams. And that's all. I mean, how about we going to speak about the MTFP, I guess? Or no? No, it's not on the business board agenda. Ah, okay, wonderful. Perfect. So that's all. I'm sorry for the confusion. Thank you, Bruna. Um, I am going to come back to a point that I believe Vic made earlier, which is we, we all have copies of the reports, but I do think for some of these sections, um, we perhaps need to revisit the ability to be able to share this data on the screen so that we're all focused on the same points. I think that would really help in terms of just continuity when you're explaining certain key tables. So I appreciate there are different technical limit limitations and account ownership and so on, but perhaps that's something could be investigated for future meetings just to help, particularly on, on finance ones. Um, yes, thanks. No worries. Belinda, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for those those data, Bruna. Um, forgive me if this is a naive question, but we we have been looking at financial at, at budgets that have looked quite similar to this in terms of there's quite a lot of red on there. And um, how concerned should we be and what are the consequences more critically? Um, I'm, I'm worried that we kind of note that the status and then we note the status again. And where, what, what's the nuclear position? Is there a nuclear position? And apologies again for the naive question, um, but we are a business board and most businesses mm -hmm. I think would be slightly fretful at looking constantly at, at data that, that are really slightly troubling. Okay, so in relation to in, to revenue that is coming in this year, so income that is coming in this year, that is no risk on it um, at the moment, no, more for, no, nothing that we can see. So on that side, we are perfectly okay. In the other side, so when you look at what we are going to spend, the major um, concern will be what we are going to spend through GEG. But that's not going to be... if please correct me, Steve, or Rob, if I'm wrong, but that does not imply we will going to lose this money. We can reinvest it and do something else with it if this is not going to go ahead the way, the way in which we originally planned, which is not brilliant because, of course, that means it will take longer for us to do an effective job in the region, but still it's not a waste of money. So we are not losing anything. Okay, I'm just. I'm, are, are there consequences? I mean, there where there is kind of underspend and not great performance. Um, are, are we all comfortable with with where we are? Comfortable is probably not quite the word that we'll use, but there is no risk in the funds to disappear. That is the thing I'm more worried about. If you are saying, of course, we will wish the plan to go ahead and everything that is in the budget to be spent to time and all the grants that we want to give out to give, down, give them out as soon as possible so the economy will benefit as soon as possible. There is no doubt about that. So I'm not saying that I'm at ease with it, but as we are not going to have to refund any, to the, or any of the money to anybody, I'm not concerned. There is no department uh, behind the government department that are expecting these funds back. So we are not losing anything. OK, thank you very much. Right. Uh, thanks, Belinda. I, I think that's a fair question because historically there have been occasions, albeit different top pots, where if we've not found ways to fully commit, there is an opportunity that we lose that funding. So I think that's a, a valid question. Steve, before I jump to you, can I just also ask you, Bruna, in terms of Section 7, the last bit of the report you just touched on, there is a changing color scheme that's, that's used for that table and data. And I just wondered if that was intended for any particular purpose. Sorry, give me a second. Uh, for the enterprise zone receipts. No, uh, no, sorry, apologies. 
I'm just awesome. conscious it's it's reflecting a surplus, but shown in red, which can be a bit misleading as well. But all the all the income is negative in the report. It's, it's just not always red. Correct. So maybe that's um, just one to. Yes. To be so if you look at the revenue, if you look at the first tab, the table one, that is all about our income. This is all negative and is all red. Okay. Steve? So it's, it's the thing that is inconsistent is the blue line. Apologies, I didn't. I oversaw the expenditure is blue instead of black. Okay, it's not a problem. Thank you. Apologies. Steve? Yeah, uh, good afternoon. Just wanted to just add to what Bruna um, was explaining there about growth works and the and actually quite a lot of the, the biggest amount of funding in the tables that's behind is attributed to that. So um, quite right, we do have some of the funds which are um, that, that feed into growth work. So um, ESF to pay for the skill side, um, uh, money from DVT to pay for the growth hub. We have to spend those by a certain date, otherwise we do, we are penalised, we lose it, we, we, it's gone to us. So that's important. But the big chunks of money uh, is coming from our own recycled funding. So to pay for the, the final parts of the service and the bigger thing on capital is this equity investment. And if currently the Growth Works is tracking um, uh, ahead of its overall jobs target. So our contract, our weekly meetings with the contractor are very focused on are they going to get the pipeline across the line that, that uses this money for the investment? So if they don't, that money stays with us. It, it won't get invested. And then the board will decide what to do with it. But the good news is we're not behind on the jobs target creation. So um, the impact there, um, uh, you know, is is the question about what, you know, should it still go out and do what we intended? Time will be up, but the jobs will have been created in a different way the board will be able to use the money to do other useful things. Thank you, Steve. Can I hand over to Nick? Well, it's really in response to Belinda, because I like her, I appreciate her bringing attention to, to the concern. I mean, as Steve just articulated, there is, an, there is an element of we need to make sure that we're spending money in the right way and in a timely manner. Um, I'm not quite sure if maybe Richard, as you know, as the senior officer, wants to add in that with the new arrangements and obviously new practices within the combined authority around single assurance framework about delivery in a timely manner. That any concerns that Belinda quite rightly is raising are, are, are kind of um, sort of hopefully um, reduced. But um, I, I want to just thank Belinda for drawing attention to that matter because I, I think we do need to be on the case it's often you know difficult in a public meeting to sort of be too challenging but on, on this one I think we do need to be and I don't know how you feel Richard but if I can ask you maybe to comment as the senior officer here if that's okay with you chair absolutely can't hear you Richard Sorry, I do apologise. Um, yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Nick. I mean, the single assurance framework will provide a rigour um, around all of our, you know, uh, investment decisions and will enable all of our programmes to to go through a process that is that is robust. So we will have to be, you know, meeting Treasury standards on 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 all of the investment decisions that we're making. It's not it's not so much that that um, we're, we're, we're not making those at the moment. It's more to do with the fact that um, we've had investment programmes um, linked, you know, in the past to particular funds from government. And we're still in those silos, if you see what I mean, even in relation to shared prosperity fund, market towns fund and so on. And delivery is really key. Um, but delivery you know, in those situations depends, as you well know, big time on the, the local authorities um, delivering those projects in their communities. And, you know, that that that's an issue for us in terms of the collaboration around those moving forward. But I think we will start to get a better handle on the overall levels of investment through an investment committee that we're setting up, through a single assurance framework, 
through a real sense of rigor around what our big priorities are right across the piece so that we're more joined up as a combined authority um, and I think that's it that's the transition that we're, we're seeking to make there's a bit of legacy around that at the moment and you know we're, we're dealing with that but that that's the direction of travel and I think things will will improve but as has been said I don't think there is a big risk on the income um, that's mentioned that that Steve mentioned around the recycled income and so on and so forth that that will come through um, and as far as we can see we, even though it looks a bit of a bleak picture at the moment we can we we we, there isn't anything that is at the moment giving us any real major concerns in relation to getting the spend and the balance of the budget as we would expect. So I'm I'm comfortable with the position at the moment. Um, and I think, you know, I think as we um, grow as an organisation, we will improve the way that we make those decisions moving forward. Thank you, Richard. I Belinda, can I just come back to you and say, are you happy in terms of response to, to your question on that? I think that was really helpful, actually. And, and thank you, Richard, for expanding on that. As, as you say, it's not that it's been bad to date, but it's going to be even better going forward. And I think that's that's very reassuring. So thank you. Excellent. Mike, over to you, sir. You're on mute, Mike, I'm afraid. Mike, we're not able to hear you. Unfortunately, there's no sound coming, Mike. Um, I, I think that was a gesture to throw his computer out of the room, which is probably <laughs> extreme. Mike, I'm going to carry on, and if you want to come back when you've had a chance to check your, your audio, then by all means. Are there any other questions for Mike at this point, as other than from, from Mike at this point for Bruna? No? Okay, do you want to give it one more try, Mike? No, sadly not. Okay, uh, I'm sure we can pick up on any points subsequently. Um, this also is a, a, rec a recommendation just to note. So can we all agree that uh, Bruna's updated finance report has been noted, please? Excellent, thank you. Um, okay, so moving on, 2.3, Business Board Chair's update. As you'll appreciate, um, I have a very small window of updates to provide updates on. Um, what I thought was appropriate to share with board members and officers is um, since taking over the role beginning of August, um, I have very much focused around reaching out and meeting with a number of stakeholders, key officers. Um, I've spoken to most of the district council leads at this point across the region. I have two more to meet with this week, as well as having a number of meetings with stakeholders who are involved in the current reviews or governance reviews at the combined authority. So definitely more listening than, than uh, talking, but I don't think that's a bad thing at all. What has been a common theme, and I've, I've already referenced it a couple of times just in terms of responses to topics raised so far today's meeting, um, is, is I do believe with the changing governance and role of the business board, we have experienced capable people supporting a number of the different key committees across the combined authority. And we do need to find the best way to bring that insight and information back and connect the dots for want of a better term at the full business board, as well as making sure we can get the external insight on other policies and recommendations across the region that are being shared. So we have scheduled a number of meetings post this for business board members, and I hope there will be in the near future an opportunity for a get together and a deep dive. And I've already flagged with officers that potentially that will mean a change to the business board agenda where there may be opportunities to get brief statements and reports from business board members who are sitting on other committees so that we can also help to bring together insights from those to help shape slightly broader decisions that we may take on the business board. Um, I'm going to just say there's a dot, dot, dot at the end of that, because I think it's only right that the business board members individually, and we are, as Dom's confirmed, going to be recruiting a number of new members to join us by November. 
and we'll be bringing some fresh skills and I hope some fresh ideas and that will ultimately shape the format and direction of travel that we take as a business board so perhaps conveniently I watch this space but as always if anybody has any specific views or points they want to get across please do reach out to me I'm more than happy to have a chat uh, but I hope by November we'll have a much clearer collective picture on, on how we think both the information presented to us and the guidance we share out can best be represented. Does anybody have any questions or comments on that? Nope, excellent. Okay, that's uh, both a thank you and relief on that one. So that's very good. So I'm gonna move to part three of the agenda. Uh, first up um, is Steve Clark um, to talk about our strategic funds management review. Over to you, Steve. Thanks, Al. Uh, good afternoon, board members. Um, so this is the usual uh, update report. Um, it's quite a succinct report this time around. I've tried to keep it very focused um, on all the current headlines, if you like, of the various programmes. Um, obviously, this gives you a, a summary up to the, a point in the middle of August when we were um, we, we cut off comp compilation. Um, so a few highlights just to pick out. So um, in the current spend on projects, there's two projects still showing a, a zero pound uh, spend. One of those is the College of West Anglia Net Zero Centre, and that's being dealt with as a separate paper at 3.2 in this meeting with a change request. Uh, the other project is the Ramsey Produce Hub, which is, um, which is still going ahead, although in the background they've had to make a few adjustments to the type of building, lease and other things that they were doing. But the other key component was the UK SPF funding that's going in to be deployed alongside it. That funding agreement is signed. And so what you will see is um, uh, some activity and spend starting to happen now over the next quarter with that project. So that's good. Um, the, um, there is still one project remaining from the original LGF, um, which is still uh, contracted to spend, and that's the Start Code on Investment Fund. They've still got 1.8 million to go. That will be invested the rest of this year and then through 24, uh, year 24-25. Um, uh, confident that that will all be deployed as was agreed and signed in our funding agreement with them. Um, quarterly monitoring of projects is attached to the report. Um, and we continue to make progress on pretty much most of the fronts within that. Um, but there's also, as we now do this quarterly, we, we pick out a particular project and have provided a bit more of an in-depth case study. So the um, University of Cambridge West Hub project, which the Business Board gave a grant to back in 2020, is featured in that um, uh, case study. Um, and it's a, it's a fantastic facility. Myself and a couple of the other officers visited it fairly recently. And um, it's already a well-used multi-use facility and um, quite an asset for um, not just the university, but the whole community, actually, uh, and, and the business and startup community as well, which was our always our reason for investing. Um, the um, uh, So uh, just touching briefly on the gain share projects in the in the paper, it, it, it gives you an update that both projects are moving towards um, getting into the marketplace. The investment fund is still going through procurement. The Market Towns phase two is at a stage where actual in, in expressions of interest are being scored. And so some projects will be getting funded through that. Um, we'll bring a much more substantive update on those particular two projects to the January Business Board and Combined Authority Board, um, just by way of update. And then finally, I was going to pick out 2.8. We recently um, uh, had a very uh, swift opportunity to participate in uh, a joint bid with um, Anglia Ruskin University and the Welding Institute, Essex County Council and Cambridgeshire County Council to compile a bid to try and secure funding through Innovate UK to um, build and uh, write a local industrial decarbonisation plan. Um, decision is expected in a few weeks, so we'll keep you posted on that one. So I'll keep it brief there and just um, take any questions that board members have. 
Thank you, Steve. Are there any questions from anybody to raise on that? Vic, please far away. Keeping them simple now, the report we got on the West Hub, was it an independent report or did we write it in-house? And the second point would be, were there any KPIs? When we look at the slide called Success and Future Plans, were there any KPIs that we should be reviewing this against because it would be a good reference? Um, so, uh, very quick response. We wrote, we wrote the case study. Um, the uh, officers, so um, uh, I can't take the credit, so uh, Presh and Louisa um, uh, worked together with the actual project lead um, to put the case study together. So it's just, we're doing that now once a quarter, we've run a process just to bring them to life really, and to give them some exposure through this process. So um, on the KPIs question, um, I assume this is in relation to the West Hub, that you're saying this yeah um there would have been kpis in their original grant funding agreement that we would have been um measuring against and i do take your point um they're not in this <laughs> um case study as such so um that's something we'll take away um, we can probably provide you with what they are um in terms of their targets separate to this meeting but a good point for future case studies to put something in about what they're actually going to deliver and how they're doing on that actual specific KPIs. Steve, thank you. I, I think the point's made. It's great to see um, successful projects and get those that kind of visual sense of how they're progressing, but there's also that counter challenge in terms of how successful compared to what we originally anticipated. Um, but I think there's been conversations previously about perhaps how we shape some of those KPIs in the future as well. So that's perhaps a, just a good note to make sure we can join the two together in future. Any other questions on that? I don't think there are any significant deviations from what was previously being shared. No, okay. Um, you'll be shocked to hear folks. This is um, just a recommendation to note. So can we all agree that we have noted on this one? Um, one that's been touched on, thank you on that, um, that was touched on, um, which does require more than a note, but actually needs a consensus view, uh, is item 3.2, the net zero training centre, where there's been a project change request that's been shaped in the notes, and Louisa is here to uh, run us through item 3.2. Hi to Louisa. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Business Board. Um, yes, uh, Cower the College of West Anglia, Steve, referred to in terms of the change request that's come forward for the Net Zero Hub. Um, the paper points out that this was approved by the Business Board in 2020, some time ago, when we uh, supported them in a partnership with Fenland District Council and their levelling up fund uh, proposal. Unfortunately, when uh, Fenland were not successful in their levelling up proposal, it left the College of West Anglia with uh, a small hole in their budget. Uh, we agreed that they would be able to go away and look at how the uh, project could be funded, how they could still deliver uh, what they wanted to deliver, maybe on a smaller scale, uh, and it has actually taken this long for them to come forward with the change request. They've done significant work with uh, partners, in particular Anglia Water, to bring in some additional funding, and they have um, re-looked at the building itself. So it's a slightly smaller building, but it pretty much delivers exactly what they said they would deliver in their initial application, but uh, utilising uh, a smaller building um, and reduced match funding. Uh, the builder, we've taken their change request. It's had a due diligence check uh, that we would normally do on all of our projects. Uh, and the independent appraisal came back with, it still offers excellent value for money. It's working with a particular sector that we're keen to support. And it's supporting, obviously, the Finland region in terms of skills. Uh, the paper is looking for recommendations from the business board to the combined authority board for uh, sign off uh, an agreement for the change request. Uh, I'm hoping that you've had opportunity to read the uh, paper that I've put forward, had a look at the um, 
appendices, which has been the change request, the additional, uh, the original application, and um, the due diligence report as well. But if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Louisa. Are there any questions from board members? Um, my my take was clearly that it was a um, a scaled down project, the same in percentage terms, investment versus scale back on the same percentage in terms of skill, opportunities from jobs creation, skills creation, I should say. Um, but the project still followed on the same basis as was originally approved, just on a reduced scale with a slightly different funding mix. Uh, Nick, over to you and then Rebecca. Uh, yeah, quick question. Obviously, the Luff bill, um, bid wasn't successful. We keep going. We believe in it from the start. I certainly do. Um, is Fenland District Council putting anything into this then? In total, so I haven't got all the figures in front of me at the moment. Or is this all? This is combined authority working with power, and we're doing it, you know, alongside them. Yeah, it's it's ourselves, power, and Anglia Water. There's no additional funding from Finland District Council. No, okay. So I just want to double check. Okay, well that, yeah. that's good. I mean, I know we've done other work with Anglia yeah. Water, and and that's a positive place to go. I'm very happy with it. Thank you, Louisa. Not a problem, Rebecca. I just wanted to reflect this back to the previous conversation really about Finland and the sort of wider big picture strategic. It feels right that we're putting investment in Finland, but it, it needs to be uh, with our eyes open and, and making sure we get most um, out of it rather than just kind of chucking money in, in that direction without a clear strategy. So I just wanted to, I suppose, flag that again, given the, the earlier conversation. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah. I, I suppose in some sense this has had now two layers of scrutiny, both the original proposal from agreement and then the second level of scrutiny from officers around the revised proposals. Um, but uh, your note in terms of regional area, Rebecca, I think is well made. Vic, would you like to uh, share a view? I mean, the last thing I'm going to say today, I'm sorry. Right, so um, just to be clear on page, I think it's page 91, other options considered. Um, it really does say either wait for more funding or walk away from the project. Was there really no other um, possibilities here that could have been considered? Let's be clear, it's absolutely brilliant. We need this. And if Fenland can cope with it and it has the skills uh, to draw on, brilliant. But were there really no other alternatives? I think that will be why it's taken a year for the change request to come through. They've significantly worked with others, with partners, with ourselves um, to look at um, other options and there seriously are no other options available to them. They've, they've worked quite hard. Uh, certainly, um, they've, they've reflected to us how hard they've worked to pull together this change request and to continue with the project. And they're really keen to do that. And we're really keen to support them. And so we've 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 worked with them as much as we can to look at alternatives, but unfortunately, there are none. Thank you, Louisa. Um, I don't see any other hands up, so I am gonna take a, a feedback on this one from you all because this is one where we need to um have a consensus. So I'm gonna Assume based on the comment, sorry, Andy, did you have a comment or were you stretching a limb? No, no, I was just going to say that I was supporting the change, but I think it's, I think Vic's right to ask the question about the options, but they've clearly gone and explored them and this is a sensible thing to support. It would be worth making the point to Fenland that we are being very generous to them. Thank you, Andy. So given there seems to be a, a consensus in support of the recommendation, can I ask if any board member disagrees, could you raise your hand now? I don't see any hands. So we'll take that um, then as carried unanimously. Um, and I don't think on that basis we need to move to a particular vote on that. I think we've got clarity on that to pass through. So let's move on Thank to- Thank you very much. Let's move on to agenda item 3.3, UK skills, projects, mobilisation and succession planning for the skills brokerage service. I see we have Fliss on the line. Welcome, Fliss. 
uh, and you're going to uh, lead on presenting this report. I am. Good afternoon, Chair, and congratulations too on your appointment and good afternoon, board members too. Um, so this paper has been, nice snappy title, isn't it? But this paper has been to the Skills and Employment Committee this morning and has unanimous support. So what we're bringing this paper here for, again, is endorsement to note, um, to make sure that you're fully appraised of the current situation with what's going to happen with the end of the contract with Growth Works with Skills, um, and therefore how we're going to take forward the existing service that we have um, and what funding we're going to utilise. So as you'll all be aware, Growth Works with Skills or the Growth Works programme comes to an end on the 31st of December. Um, and the skills element was funded through the European Social Fund. What we're doing going forward is we've managed to secure some of the people and skills strand of the UK SPF, and that's for 15 months. The pot of money is smaller. However, we are planning to take forward, uh, continue to take forward a skills brokerage, look at how we can um, deliver uh, part of our vision into delivering an all-age career service and also look to... Um, um, bring back, I guess, the supported internships that we managed to fund through the Community Renewal Fund uh, in Peterborough and Fendland too. So there is an exempt appendices on here. So if anyone wants to talk about Appendix 2, I think we need to go into closed session. Um, so the detail around it is that we are looking to bring the service in-house. This is because the project is only for 15 months and therefore to mobilise and procure and then close a project in that time would be too short a time frame. So the plan is to use it almost as a pilot to see how the combined authority takes this forward um, internally. We have already partially rescutched the skills team. So the roles within the skills brokerage will fit really quite nicely. And so therefore we'll be working with economic development officers, um, uh, providers and also employers at the same time. There are some Tupli implications because part of that service is transferring over. And as part of Growth Works with Skills, we also have the Careers and Enterprise Company contract, and that also will be moving over as well. So the plans outlined in here, hopefully you can see the budget and also see the proposed staffing structure. And it really is just to seek your endorsement or take any comments on the, the plans that are proposed. Um, the, the timeline of, of, of the next steps are that the paper that went this morning and what you're receiving this afternoon will go to the combined authority board and assuming that is um, endorsed at combined authority board then we will start mobilizing bringing the growth works with skills contract to an end and going into discussion about GP arrangements and also if there are any redundancies or need to recruit new staff. I think that probably highlights the key points for you obviously yeah. happy to take questions. Fliss, thank you for that, and, and thank you for flagging the exempt note, and that, that would be something we would need to take to a, a, a private session if anybody wanted to reference to that. My apologies, I, I should have flagged that. Uh, I think one of the key points is the fact that it's been to um, the board for review this morning for the, the skills board, and, and that's had that feedback. Um, I'm interested if anybody else from the business board has any comments or any other points they'd like to raise towards it. Um, we seem to be on a, a fairly clearly defined trajectory on this one, and there's a clear plan, which is um, which is positive. Um, I'm not seeing any hands up at this stage here. I suppose the one question I, I can think that probably is is worthy of question, um, this is going to be about capacity. There's obviously two P implications, but in terms of any recruitment implications, are we happy the timeline and, and transition is one where that can still be met seamlessly i hope so so there are more um there are less positions and current staff employed um however i imagine there'll be some natural um people leaving at the same time we are ready to go on the first of october so i'm hoping if we start those conversations at the earliest possibility we will know um, and that's why we've designed it so that we've got enough time to recruit in if needs be Excellent. Thank you, Fliss. Uh, Rebecca. Thanks, Chair. And I'm I'm looking ahead again, Fliss, and you highlighted that 15 months wasn't very long. And certainly when you, re oh, sorry, when you relate it to sort of our meetings and things, I, I wondered if you'd given any thought to um, 
beyond that and and the preparations for beyond that because it doesn't give a lot of time to get settled in and consider whether it's working before we need to start planning <coughs> what happens beyond the 15 months yeah so as far as I'm aware and colleagues please alert me if I've missed something but I don't think we know the next stage of SPF so I am hoping that there will be some recurrent funding we've always had a skills brokerage within the combined authority area so I'm hoping that either through external sources or from sources within the combined authority that funding is found to carry on this work but no clear plan as yet. We need to mobilise. And then as soon as we've mobilised, whoever is my successor, I will be flagging it as a, a key priority. Thank you for this. I don't see any other questions. So can I take consensus that we're happy to note this report at this stage? Good. Thank you. And thank you for this. Appreciate it. Thanks, Sam. Um, Item 3.4, Economic Growth Strategy Implementation Plan. Um, Steve, another one for you, please, sir. Yeah, good afternoon again. Um, so uh, back in March, the Business Board um, uh, approved uh, Economic Growth Strategy EGS Implementation Plan. It was then um, uh, approved and adopted at the Combined Authority Board on the 22nd of March. So this report is bringing what is the first... Um, update on that it's only a few months since the plan was updated effectively only for just over four months so um, we did agree in the plan to bring uh, updates twice a year so the the next one due in March um, will probably be uh, I hope well I hope will be a bit more substantive than this one this is quite a light overview at this stage um, so um, the the report um, is um, is intended to give obviously the the insight that the board needs to track some of the performance now our plan has quite a mixture of um, short term projects and then a few longer term aspirations um, what this update doesn't provide is the um, outputs on any of the data measures at this stage at the back of the implementation plan there was a an annex which was all the data points that we were hoping to measure. Um, some of those are now being picked up in the state of the region activity. Some of those um, will be reported periodically through this process as we go forwards, but they're not, they're not in this particular update. Um, there is obviously, as the earlier discussion around state of the region, there is an opportunity here to um, think about um, any kind of refresh or changes or additions to the economic growth strategy. Um, I would propose that that would be after the first year is done and the board can reflect and look forward to any new priorities, any new data points that are saying do something different um, and we can we can work that. It was always designed to be quite a flexible strategy um, in, in, the, in the approach. So in terms of the programme level detail, um, some of the programme updates you, you will see um, in the appendix, um, we've, we've got some good um, programme updates, um, some we've, we've been chasing and we've still not had updates in time. So as I was saying, hope to perhaps have more detail on those at the next iteration. But the, the appendix does show that there's been uh, some progress on many of the projects and programmes. So I, I would say you know, there's been a, a reasonable start on those things. Some of them were ongoing anyway. For example, the business growth service, which is showing obviously quite high percentage now. But but many of the others have, you know, got underway in the period um, there. So um, obviously um, it's in the board's gift to, um, you know, potentially review these and decide and maybe take a challenge um back around these there is um as part of the new assurance framework there's a new um, economic growth advisory of growth officers advisory group being established that's meeting next week part of that group's mission will be to look at this too because many of the local authorities are actually many of the leads in these projects and programs so that group will have the remit of reviewing progress around this as well and will be able to provide 
again, some further feedback and challenge on whether some of this is progressing, not progressing, where there's actions needed, um, and pass that back to the business board. Um, at a strategic level, um, uh, some of the outputs um, are much longer term. So some of the higher level things like reducing inequality as they're, they're long-term measures. And as I've already said, we'll need to look at the data trends over a longer period of time. So when we come back again in March to see if this plan is having an effect and if we need to change anything there. Um, as, as has been flagged already, the board approved a new economy team at the last board. The main mission of that team is to drive the delivery of the EGS. And at the moment, the job descriptions are being written and a plan is um, being um, agreed with HR. And so recruitment will get underway, um, I'm hoping, within the next few weeks. And so we will bring forward this new team, which will be able to help take ownership of many parts of this implementation plan, things like the sector strategies and um, themes like trade and investment. So. Um, so that should be good. And then, um, as has been mentioned as well, the state of the region review, the piece of work that's been kicked off, um, again, the board will need to reflect. When that comes back um, later in January, need to reflect how that fits with this work. Um, and then one can inform the other. So I'll, I'll stop there and happily take any questions. Thank you, Steve. Um, lots of information there. And I, I do think the... Uh, the the appendix report shared in terms of progress shows there has been some some key activity on quite a few other strands it's a nice format to look at as well it's quite accessible uh nick did you want to comment you're on mute sir okay. thank you uh chair um thank you again steve uh, an interesting table uh, and sort of good to remind that there is conversations going between the combined authority yourselves and obviously linking up uh, with constituent authorities. I guess when I see a document like this, uh, the one thing I'm kind of keen to understand, particularly after you get past the first, you know, seven or eight, nine um, kind of projects, which are wholly owned by CPCA. I'm mm -hmm. trying to understand where we have partnership arrangements and oh, you know I'm all about partnership. I'm, I'm really trying to understand in that table, is there, is there a kind of almost like a percentage to say who's in charge? Because when I see something like that, uh, and I'm say particularly drawn towards, uh, well, I don't know, medical device and technology rapid prototype facility and Wintringham Park. Now, I can remember long before I became a mayor that I was a district councillor in that area. And I know those things have been bouncing about forever. And I'm trying to understand, well, hold on, I now have an interest in that particular interest area. Where, where are we in this? Are we just, yes, we're, we're, we're it's in our, <laughs> it's in our kind of um, document is something that is being done on our patch. But what are we actually involved in doing it? Apart from just being listening, and I kind of, because if, even if it's just 10%, I've got 10% of my uh, mayoral responsibilities in there, and I want to know we're getting our 10% worth and we're doing 10% of the job. So um, I don't know if it's a question about how you present the information, but it's more a case of demonstrating how we got responsibility, and if we have, how would you demonstrate it, and how do we guarantee if we have no responsibility, we're just going to be, you know, watching other people's outcomes. Do they know that they're actually on the form? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the um, so just to answer that, the economic growth strategy was developed in partnership with all the local authorities. Um, so this this isn't just our strategy; it's everybody's strategy, and they all signed up to it. And the leaders through all the consultation meetings we had last year, they all, you know, some wanted things added, some wanted things taken off. But we all agreed and got to a consensus and this is it. So um, things do move on, though. I do take that, you know, and some of these projects and why I said the economic growth strategy should remain. Uh, and we always said this a bit of a live thing. It shouldn't be done. And then we're still looking at it three years and, you know, same things. And clearly things have moved on. Um, I do take your point. The lead here, there's varying degrees of involvement from everybody. So. On a project like that, yes, I would say that HDC are the primary lead. 
Um, but then there's going to be a developer in the background that's going to be involved. And then there's going to be a question about funding. And I think that's why we're in there, because we were seen as potentially down the line. I know it's not straight away, but down the line, we are possibly one route to trying to help them with funding. And then there's lots of other things, lobbying and other activities like East West Rail potentially have an impact in helping unlock some of those projects in terms of future growth. So, um, so yes, our involvement will vary. Um, so I don't know, maybe we can add a column which says, you know, what our role is, whether we're lead or we're supporter or we're, I don't know what the definitions are, but there could be a, a handful of definitions that, that sort of outline where our, where, where we are in this. So um, if it was just our plan, but we have our own directorate, we have an economy and growth directorate plan, that's where would be all the projects we lead. So this is a, this is a broader thing. Yeah, Chair, if I can come back. So, uh, it, it, so thank you, Steve. I, I think it's probably what I'd guessed at, but, that, but I think it needs to be clearer because I think, you know, be it as the mayor, be it as the business board, if these are in documents that are put in front of us, by definition, we feel some degree of ownership over it. And therefore, we need to feel what control we can exert or what advice we can give to make these things happen. I mean, as I say, there, there may be, depending on geographical things, the people who are on the ground working in those various areas may well be able to you know, help and leverage more support to get things moving. I have direct conversations with people from urban and civic on a reasonably regular basis, but a reminder that actually this is part of the role. So again, I think if they're on the form, then we're part of it. How much percentage wise? Well, that's another, uh, another argument. And I do take on board, this is a strategy that we have all agreed on. But I think we need to be very clear about when you're bringing that sort of information to us, what is the ask of what you know what you want us to do be it constituent members of the business board because as i say people may go away and look at that list now and going oh yeah i was interested how that's going on and i want to help and see what's you know regarding that particular support so i think we're going to need to move on that and i'd appreciate if there's an action to kind of look at that again and maybe even Ask business board members elsewhere. Do that? Are there any of those particular um, projects that they feel that they have an understanding of and want to be more involved in? I don't know. Points well made, Nick. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, thanks, Chair. I'm not quite sure whether this is just a, a suggestion or a further challenge, Steve. But what I'm really struggling to see in it is the read across from the report we had at the beginning so the report we had at the beginning which kind of said <clears throat> we're not going to hit our GBA and Fenland is not doing very well I, I'm struggling to then look at this and go ah but it's okay because we're doing this and this and this and therefore I feel reassured that we've got it all in hand mm. um, and and I suppose I'll just just kind of leave it maybe for the next iteration to see if somehow we can weave a bit of that in yeah, I, I I do take your point because you you've got to take the context of the strategy, the implementation plan, and then now here we have a another kind of uh, cut of some of the activity and programs and projects. So yeah, I, I I do take your point. It's the perhaps a section on the more broader themes that were in the original plan, not not these quite granular. So maybe it's it's those higher ones. And as I'd already said, the data points, all the data measures we'll try and bring those next time because then they can be put against that state of region data to see if there is actually um you know areas of you know concern uh, difference yeah thank you thank you steve i think we've um covered all the the questions on that point um so i'm hoping we can all take this as agreement that that's been noted thank you steve um, we're in the home straight, folks, so I'm going to move to item 3.5, CPCA Director's Update. Richard, um, chance for you to provide a quick update. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, th thanks, Al. Yeah, and I'll try to be try to be brief, given, as you say, we're in the home straight now. Um, so there were a couple of things I just wanted to mention, picking up on some of the conversation we've already had, actually, but, but there's... Um, 
we we you know we've got the we've got some big events coming out we've got we've got a general election um which could be as soon as may 2024 it could be it could be later but it doesn't feel that far away anymore to me and i don't think it feels that far away to many people um and i'm thinking um we need we need to be in a real state of readiness for the next general election i think you know there's lots of organizations and local authorities and combined authorities preparing the ground now um working out you know what it means what do we want to do do we have a plan you know and uh, taking on board all the things that we've talked about already today is it is it has to be flexible it has to be agile but nevertheless you know we know that we're going to be asked about our strategies our priorities our propositions our asks and our offers you know and i think the more that we can start to get into that space the sooner the sooner we do that the better and i think you know we need to find a we need to find mechanisms for doing that either informally uh individually with board members collectively with 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 business board members but i think it's it's really key that we we work out you know what 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 those things look like and i think you know that, that that's really going to be key for us um moving forward and i think we should build on all the foundations that we're talking about you know metro dynamics have not only done some of the work that they've done today but they did a big evaluation of the local growth fund the 150 million what of, of all that 150 million what projects are still sitting there that need phases two and three building on top of them is that the university of peterborough what what you know what happens there you know there's a lot of things for us to think about and a lot of opportunities you know should we be preparing the ground for you know are we going to get innovation zones it looks like we're going to get further devolution so i think i think that's a really key point that i want to flag i haven't got all the answers as to how we're going to do that but i think it's really important that we we start that that conversation now um secondly i just wanted to mention also alongside that is the autumn statement and that's going to be quite important and we're doing all we can at cambridgeshire and peterborough to the combined authority to get on the coattails of the m10 as you know and if that if that does land and there is a, a statement um, around, you know, a core offer with the M10, then again, that's going to mean that, that we're going to have an opportunity to put some things forward relatively quickly. We have been in the background. We have been doing some work on that. Um, we've been trying to get our technical evidence uh, base and 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 you know thinking together around some of that with some of the local authorities but again i think that need that will need if if it's a, if it's a runner and we get the green light that will need business board member engagement and contribution i think moving forward i think it's really important that we we get the business community on side and behind us you know and it nothing all nothing all land well without it so i think that's another thing i wanted to flag and alongside that there is also obviously government's interest in Cambridge 2040. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about Cambridge 2040, but it says an awful lot about the importance of Cambridge, about life sciences, some of the issues that were raised earlier, the issues that were in um, the, port, the report that Patrick produced around infrastructure constraints. And again, I think, you know, we need to be on those issues and, and making a contribution. And again, I would urge us as a combined authority to support our our you know our local authorities support our business communities in in how we engage with government in terms of making cambridge 2040 a success so i think that is important and and that isn't you know missing out all the rest of the the patch because i think i think you know there are there, there are issues that can be brought together to make connectivity improve there are linkages between the issues that can be built on that can give us a dialogue with government that, that can that can open up further opportunities down the line so i just think it's really important we get our, our, our head around that in in the coming weeks um and then just just a few a few things just very very quickly i wanted to mention one was um we're working with the oxford cambridge partnership at the moment around developing an investment atlas prospectus and i think that could be quite key for us moving forward and that builds on some of the things that we've done in relation to dbt and the call for projects and the global summit that they're organizing at the moment so i think again you know we need to be if, if we're going to work with the Cambridge partnership, uh, Cambridge Oxford partnership, we need to be very clear about, you know, what we want to pitch in as part of that and what we want to get out of it. So again, you know, it's, 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 it's an opportunity to promote our propositions on a massive scale and, you know, working that through 
uh, in the coming weeks and months is going to be really important. Um, that brings me on to something else, which is about U UK Reef and MIPIM. And, you know, we're thinking about, you know, how we prepare the ground for those two big events next spring. So I think, again, you know, we need perhaps to bring a report to the next business board on U UK Reef and MIPIM and whether we want to uh, whether we want to engage and how we might want to engage collaboratively around those opportunities. Um, I also wanted to mention that DCMS have got a growth initiative on the go at the moment, uh, working with Creative UK. Um, they're identifying high growth, creative industries, ecosystems and investment models. And I know, I think, I think Nick's got a meeting, the mayor has a meeting coming up with the Creative UK board in September. And again, I think that's something that we ought to be engaging with. The spear refresh, the state of the region work is really key. Um, again, you know, the business board needs to be fully engaged uh, in that agenda, given, you know, spear uh, one came out of um, the, the, the work that you all did. So, you know, we need to make sure we get that right. Um, and then finally, just picking up on a couple of things that Steve mentioned, we are bringing in uh, a new economy team and that will add a bit of capacity and capability and hopefully it will help us strengthen our sector strategies and support business board members in their sort of championing of those sector strategies and the development of those sector strategies. What we're not trying to do is um, develop those strategies and, and, and do all the doing. What we're trying to do is just get a little bit of capacity in-house to enable us to coordinate a bit better, strengthen what's going on and you know, create awareness, events, opportunities linked link to those sector strategies. And the same applies for trade and investment and innovation as well. And then finally, just on growth works, as has been mentioned, that's got big implications, not just for skills, as was mentioned earlier, but also for the business um, side of, of, of the support. And so that's quite a big issue for us um, as we as we make the transition. We've notified the contractor, obviously, that we're not proceeding beyond uh, the end of the calendar year. And therefore, we do need to make sure that we uh, embed uh, the processes so that there's no you know sort of slippage or the transition is handled really really very very carefully and and that's it for me thank you thank you richard it's as if there's very little coming up for us to consider after that. <laughs> <laughs> i think it highlights yeah. quite the need to make sure through different upcoming events and activities about how we need to connect the dots and the fact there is opportunities for business board members to have greater collaboration and engagement on some of these upcoming projects. Yeah. I hope adding to our cohort will certainly be a big help, but we absolutely also need to look at where stakeholders within the board have got particular areas of expertise that they can be signposted to support you in your endeavours as well. So I think there's a, quite a few items on the short-term action list for the business board, as well as then dovetailing with your good selves on how we can support and assist with that. I'm not seeing any other hands up, so thank you for your summary. I think what it highlights, as you say, is huge amount of work ahead, but also potential for huge opportunity as well. So thank you for that. Um, the last item um, from that is I have just a quick summary in terms of business board headlines for the combined authority board. In the context of today's meeting, that will be just the um, recommendation for the net zero training centre that's coming from the business board through to the combined authority board. Um, I also hope at the point we reach that, we'll also be able to share a few more thoughts that we've collectively gathered from the business board in terms of how we can further enhance and improve the way that we can collaborate across the different groups and feed into the combined authority board. But we'll um, discuss that in due course. Um, that leaves us with item 4.2, which is the forward plan, um, which everyone's had a copy of. Um, there's an opportunity if anyone wants to flag anything missing. Um, but as always, I think the recommendation is if there is something you feel should be escalated or prioritised, please do reach out to the offices and they'll be able to feed that back in. Are there any immediate comments on that forward plan? No, good. In which case, um, we have reached the end of our journey for today. Um, thank you to all the officers who've prepared all the different reports and information. Vic, I do apologise. Your hand has appeared. Please fire away.
Thank you. Just a very quick AOB. Following this morning's um, skills committee, um, there's an impact evaluation of the adult education budget. And I wondered if the business board uh, felt it should get involved because it was all about how they could make skills and education more available to meet the needs of businesses. And that evaluation is taking place at the moment. I don't know if um, Eva Fliss or Richard wanted to bring it to the business board, but I do think we should participate in that review. But I put it to you guys to, to perhaps tell me I'm misguided and wrong. As if we would ever say that, Vic. But I, I see Richard nodding, and I think that's one that Richard and Fliss can have a look and, and prepare something or bring something to appropriate segue. But it, it makes absolute sense to have some feedback, particularly as one of the things as a business board we need to do is to try and broaden the net of voices we're capturing from across the region to, to feed back into that conversation as well. Thank you, Vic, for that. Excellent. Okay, in which case, um, I believe we have reached a close to the meeting. I'm looking to see if I'm supposed to read anything else more formal than that, but I don't believe I am. So.